Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this week's Friday Forum. My name is April Shine, and I serve as the Director of Advocacy and Policy with the Foundation for Tacoma Students. The Foundation's mission is to build and strengthen the Graduate Tacoma community-wide movement of over 350 community partners to help every child achieve success from cradle to college and career. As part of our organization's response to COVID-19, Friday forums were launched to provide relevant and locally focused information and resources to our community partners and families. Over the past several weeks, we've covered a number of topics, including the state of Tacoma Public Schools, teaching and mentoring from a distance, and how state and community agencies are addressing the gap in service for students with disabilities. As a society, we would all agree that quality, accessible, and affordable early learning opportunities must be available to all zero to five-year-olds. These formative years in a child's life set the stage for their academic and social emotional success. And with good childcare options, more parents can join and flourish in our workforce. The COVID-19 pandemic has exposed how fragile our childcare system is nationally, across the state, and locally here in Tacoma Pierce County. As of May 12th, over 1,500 child care providers serving approximately 75,000 children across the state have closed. Here in Pierce County, we know 142 providers have closed. To rebuild our economy and build and begin to address the vast inequities our community is facing, we will need to get back to work as quickly as it is safe to do so. The question is, what will our child care options be? And what can we as community leaders and advocates do to rebuild and strengthen this important system? As a working mother of two young children in childcare, the issue is very important to me. Today, I have the pleasure of serving as moderator for a panel of early learning experts who will share with us what they're doing to support our youngest learners through the pandemic and answer your questions. Welcome everyone. We're so thankful to have you here with us today. As I introduce your name and uh, organization and title, if you'd please wave at the camera so everyone on the webinar knows who you are, that would be great. I'm gonna start with Nicole Rose, Director of Eligibility and Provider Supports with the Department of Children, Youth and Families for the State of Washington. Hi, Nicole. Travis Hansen, Early Learning Statewide Child Care Licensing Administrator with the Department of Children, Youth, and Families for the State of Washington. Natalie Lente, Director of Family Services, Child Care Resources. And Gail Neal, Executive Director, Multicultural Child and Family Hope Center. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Gail. Hi. My name is Gail Neal and I'm the Executive Director for Multicultural Child and Family Hope Center. Um, I was asked to talk a little bit about um, the work that we do with young children. So we have ECAP and Early ECAP, um, Early Head Start, which is a new program that's, or Early ECAP is a new program that's going to be starting next month. And then we have Early Head Start and then we have a traditional child care program. We also do respite um, care for foster kids. So we haven't closed um, at all. We've been open for essential workers in the very beginning, the first month, and then we opened up to more children um, of families that had to get back to work. We have a school age program, so we've been working really hard with our school agers to get them online every day doing their work that they get assigned through Tacoma Public Schools then also the enhanced work that we have for them. And as well, um, we've been making sure that they're getting exercises and just really having a really good time. Um, our staff have been doing really well with getting <laughs> projects going and talking to kids about COVID-19 when it's um, prompted by the child. Uh, we've kind of turned into more than just a childcare center right now. And usually we have a wraparound program that has 20 family programs of all different natures. Um, but what we're doing now is uh, two days a week, we provide lunches, it's a drive-through. Um, so it's for any families, not just families that are enrolled in our program, but anybody in the community. And then along with that, we have education kits that we put together. 
um, for children. And so we put it on Facebook. And so families have been coming by and getting that. And that's been allowed us to work out in our parking lot, um, talk to families about what's going on with them. Um, if they have other resources that they need, we've been able to help them with that. Um, whether it's housing or um, they need boxes of food, we've helped with that. Just any kind of resource. We have our family support specialists that have been out in the parking lot as well. Uh, the staff have stayed really upbeat because of all of the different services that we're doing right now. And I think a lot of times that if there's something happening like the pandemic that you have no control over, it at least feels really good and self-satisfying to know that you're doing your part in the community by helping families out. And so that was our reason for staying open right from the beginning. Our services are, are pretty different. So I don't know if you guys can see this, but this is, um, what we greet families with every day. Um, and with that, uh, we take their temperature, um, the kids' temperature, um, and then we make sure that they don't have any signs of being sick. The kids and us wear these bandanas um, over and it's kind of nice because it just pulls up. And so uh, the kids remember to put it on every day and, and we didn't have to buy them because we probably had about a thousand of them. And so that worked out really well. Um, so I think that we've been managing the services of the childcare that we have pretty well. Um, our numbers are low still. I think um, families, if they're not working, they're choosing to keep their kids home. We've had kids that have come in just for a day or two or a week. And so we've really tried to be there for anybody that needs childcare services. Um, and we're taking in special needs kids as well. So I think it's actually brought us even closer. Uh, we're a close staff anyway. We've been together for about 20 years, which is not traditional for early learning centers and childcare. Um, the other thing is we have 11 um, men that work in our center. Um, that's not traditional in childcare as well. And we have a really close relationship with the six Tacoma public schools that are right around us. So um, we've been going and working hard. And um, one of the things that I can say is the staff have made it really fun. Um, we're a fun staff anyway, but they've made it really fun by working with the uh, the um, parents when they come and just seeing how they're doing and talking about how things are going to be um, in the future so that parents are looking forward to that and we do that as well we talk about not so much are we going to end up closing but it's more like so what are we going to do when things are back to normal what do we want we have a little bit of downtime so let's talk about enhancing our our programs even more and the way we deliver services. So for us, that's really been um, good because it's kept us upbeat and positive and looking forward to the future instead of just kind of um, being scared and wondering what tomorrow's gonna bring. We've just been trying to be really positive and keep our families really positive. Uh, we've started to offer parenting meetings um, by Zoom. Um, we do recovery meetings for parents, just um, not just focusing on the kids, but also focusing on the parents that are coming to take those kids home again. Um, Thank so, you. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. That was a lot of um, a lot of information because you guys are doing a lot. Thanks. I, um, I wanted to just ask one thing about the education kits, uh, selfishly, what age are they angled to support or supposed to be supporting? Birth to five. Right now it's birth to five, but we do have education kits for older kids if it's requested from us. And our staff are having a lot of fun doing education kits. They're, they're pretty cool. Nice. I could definitely use one. <laughs> <laughs> Call me, call me right when this is over with, and we'll set that up for you. We have some pretty creative stuff going on. That's awesome. Well, thank you. Um, I know we have some questions for you that we'll come back to later on in the panel. So I'm going to pop over and um, introduce Natalie from Child Care Resources. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for having me today. It was such a pleasure hearing you speak, Gail. I, I have to say that I've been just awed 
by the resiliency of the innovation from so many childcare providers through this pandemic. It's been just this amazing uh, collaboration and um, I'm just so honored to be a part of the system in, in such a really challenging time. And Gail already offered some great ideas that I haven't thought about yet. And I'm, I'm gonna pass that, those great ideas on to other providers as well. So thank you, Gail. Um, so um, uh, first of all, um, I, I just wanted to explain a little bit about childcare resources. Um, we are one of six regions across the state participating in the state's quality rating and improvement system called Early Achievers. Uh, we provide coaching, technical assistance, and professional development services for child care providers in King and Pierce counties. Uh, we also operate the statewide, statewide Child Care Aware of Washington Family Center. It's a child care resource referral center that helps families find and pay for child care and provides information on quality care and school readiness. Uh, the Child Care Aware of Washington Family Center has been identified to serve as the statewide Child Care COVID Communication Response and Referral Center. Um, so not only are we accepting calls from families, but we're also getting calls from uh, providers, from uh, school districts, from employers, um, from health organizations, asking for information specific to child care and COVID. Today, I'd like to provide an overview of the child care industry challenges before COVID-19 and discuss for a few minutes how the, how the pandemic has magnified gaps and challenges in an industry already in crisis. So, um, so on the first slide, you'll see, um, the, you know, the childcare Washington industry has been deeply underfunded and, and overburdened for decades. Um, childcare providers um, oftentimes make little over minimum wage while the monthly cost of infant care surpasses tuition at most public universities. I think for many folks, it's surprising to hear how thin the margins are in childcare because parents are paying such a huge amount of their budget on, on care. Um, but it's, it's a, a business that's hard to find cost efficiencies because all of the expenses are relatively fixed. For example, you need to have a certain amount of adults in the room to adequately care for children. And so it's that teacher-child ratio. Uh, you have to have rent, um, food, uh, cleaning supplies, all of those costs are really difficult to reduce. Um, so it's a high cost business and parents can only afford to spend so much. And I think providers get stuck in the middle, not making very much money and not able to pay very high wages to their staff. In Pierce County, the supply of childcare has been steadily declining even before the pandemic with the biggest reduction seen in our family childcare community, uh, which typically is owned by women of color and immigrant and refugee women. These are child cares that are, that are housed in people's homes. Um, the business models, in, within these business models, you know, owners are playing multiple roles. And we often see, that, see this as, in centers as well. You know, the uh, providers are playing teacher, cook, janitor, repair person. And again, there's little or no margin of revenue. And I think for family child care providers, um, they, they really wrap their arms around communities. I think they have a really wonderful mindset of service. And we've seen that across the field for both our centers and family child cares throughout this pandemic. Um, family child care is also a, a very flexible, flexible model. Um, I, I think it's often the best environment for overnight and weekend care for non-traditional hours. We've seen a lot of essential employees that are janitorial staff at hospitals or CNAs um, that are doing shift work and needing 24 hour evening care. And that um, has been fulfilled primarily by family child care environments. Um, while prior to the pandemic, there's been an increase in the number of slots in child care centers outside of Tacoma city limits, there's an overall decrease of slots within child care centers within Tacoma, and an overall 33% decrease in the total number of family child care home slots from 2013 to 2019. Maintaining our, our family child care home supply is a critical equity issue. Uh, next slide, slide please. Um, with the COVID-19 pandemic, we're seeing an acceleration of our child care crisis. The National Association of Young Children, or NIAC, anticipates that more than half of child care programs will close across the nation, and two-thirds will not be able to reopen after an extended closure. In Pierce County, we've seen 15% of all family child care homes temporarily close and 31% of centers. In Tacoma, 15% of family child cares have temporarily, temporarily closed and 37% of centers. 
without immediate, immediate cash assistance and deep investments, much of our childcare industry will not exist when they need to reopen, especially family home childcare, which already exists with such a low margin of revenue and serves such a wide, diverse population of families. The COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the role of childcare as a backbone to our economy, enabling parents to work while their parents, while their children are in safe quality care. I think that this has come up so, so much more with so many families feeling so stressed and anxious about the pandemic and um, feeling rich relief that their, that their child has an opportunity to play and to enjoy themselves in a, a safe and a wonderful setting. Next slide, please. Um, the pandemic has magnified the need to, uh, to finally resolve the, the challenges that have confronted us for decades, not only in the state, but across the nation. And um, I think if resolved, we'll support a strong Washington state workforce and economy. It will, pro will propel far more children into high quality childcare and ensure that the essential status of early childhood educators is permanently reflected by increased investments in their education and compensation. Um, here are a few things that I think we could be doing now to resolve those challenges within the pandemic and beyond. One is investment in childcare now um, through grants to help businesses weather the crisis. This means support with rent, payroll, all of those kinds of business expenses to help providers, whether they're closed or open. And this will assist them to emerge whole when the economy reopens. Um, and these need to be ongoing investments as the cost of the provider have increased by having to run with smaller ratios of children and bring in less revenue, but having to maintain staffing. Um, also funding for essential personnel in line with the governor's broad identification, um, which means um, that access to childcare via subsidy voucher system will follow the child's placement. Uh, King County has implemented uh, emergency childcare system and have utilized a slot-based system rather than a subsidy voucher system, which has meant that families who, have, who were already utilizing a provider, if that provider was not a part of the new program, um, then they would have to shift their child from one site to the next, which is, is a, a problematic when we're really looking for continuous support of children. Um, advocacy to make sure that childcare stays high on the radar, radar of state and uh, local policymakers in the last legislative session, um, there were historic investments in early learning, which I, I think in large part were because of early learning advocacy um, fueled by funders and um, uh, private uh, funders as well. Uh, I think we also need to revise the subsidy mechanics, including eligibility in high area median income areas, such as Puget Sound, as well as dollar amount of our subsidy reimbursement. And childcare needs to be coordinated with the school district plans in the next year, um, childcare cannot be an, an after, afterthought. We have to be partnering with the school systems. Uh, next slide, please. Um, sorry, I'm, I lost my place again. <laughs> uh, so an estimated 75% of children ages birth to five years spend significant times in the care of grandparents, uncles, aunties, other siblings, or a good family friend or, or others who are part of the child's extended family. Um, these caregivers are often uh, referred to as family, friend, and neighbor caregivers, or FFN. In areas like Pierce County, uh, where there are limited options of licensed childcare, parents are especially reliant on FFN care. Access to affordable childcare is one reason why parents use FFN care. Uh, the most common reason, though, is that so many families really want to, to know, trust, and share values with the person who will be uh, supporting them in raising their children. And many of us have relied on multi-generational supports uh, to take care of our children. Uh, these factors explain why there's a higher prevalence of FFN care among some families of color and immigrant refugee families, as well as for some parents of children with special needs. Um, FFN care is often the only choice of care available to parents who work in low wage earning jobs that have non standard hours. Again, those shift workers who need weekend evenings and night care. Um, most FFN caregivers provide care to assist the parent and child and are generally not financially compensated. Though parents who qualify for the state subsidy through Working Connections are eligible for a subsidy to pay their FFN caregivers. Uh, throughout this pandemic, it's likely that families are relying much more on FFN caregivers um, by um, these, these caregivers uh, covering longer shifts and non-standard hours for essential workers. 
uh, filling the gaps when preschools, licensed childcare and schools are closed, and, and asking and relying on their high school students, the older siblings of the, of the younger uh, child, either in the home or at their usual workplace. Next slide, please. Um, there's also ways we can support FFN caregivers through the pandemic. One of them is ensuring that, they're, that they are receiving information and support, uh, and support applying for assistance from trusted advisor. Uh, these are you know, family, friends, cultural community leaders um, who can provide information, not just translated information from English, but, but uh, information that's generated from their home language and is culturally appropriate. So information about COVID prevention, child development, and caring with, uh, with children with special needs. Um, enlist these trusted advisors, these cultural navigators to help caregivers navigate and apply for assistance with basic needs like health and mental health care, supplemental income and other resources. Um, provide care caregivers with essential cleaning supplies, diapers, wipes, formula and food, and include FFN caregivers in targeted outreach. Um, when, when we do that, um, we, we have to refer to them by how they see themselves, which is grandparent, auntie, uncle, cousin, brother, sister, etc. Um, we're learning a lot as a state and a nation in this, this time of crisis, seeing how the disparities that already existed in our society are being confounded by this pandemic. I think many of us are unwilling to return to the old normal. Um, instead, I think that we need to move forward on building, what, building on the best of what we know right now about young children and their ability to thrive and learn, um, how families need stable childcare to go to work and how early childhood educators must be valued as an essential part of our economic infrastructure. Thank you so much. Yes, Natalie, to all of that. Thank you so much for all that robust information and the work you do. I wonder if you could sure. maybe put in the chat box here, but I know that Childcare Resources has been, has even stepped up as a resource during this time and has a support line. So families who are going back to work or need a different kind of childcare can call and you guys can help meet their needs and show them where local availability is, correct? Yes, that's correct. I will type in the number right here in the chat line now so that folks can access it. Perfect, I think people are gonna be needing that more than ever coming up here. Great. Okay, well, we have some questions for you that we'll circle back after we get the chance to hear from Travis and Nicole with the CYF. Great, thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. Just getting the PowerPoint up for you to be able to see this and hopefully you can see my screen now. Um, and I just wanna say thank you to Gail and Natalie for all the work that they are doing and the supports that they're providing to children and families and to providers, it's greatly appreciated. So Travis and I are gonna tag team this one a little bit. I'll start off with our, um, the larger work that we are doing across the state. Um, talk about what childcare looks like a little bit from our perspective at this point, share some short-term supports and long-term state supports. Um, that we are hoping to put in place. So um, one of the things that we always like to remind folks about is just kind of what is the reality right now as, as the stay home order stay in place, we have school closures and small group guidance. And so that's a big reality that we're trying to deal with as you think about that group size of 10. And then we have childcare sites that are closing and reopening. And uh, one of the things I wanna reiterate here is that we have not heard of any sites that have decided to close for good as of yet as it relates to COVID-19. And when we are talking about uh, closed sites, um, those are sites that are temporarily closing related to COVID-19. And we have a special uh, checkbox that they mark uh, to let us know that they're temporarily closing for that. As we think about um, the future, we've got realities and then we've got guiding principles that we really need to think about. Um, and clearly as the state begins to reopen, um, access to care becomes extremely important so that families can return to work. Um, we need to make sure that we can stabilize the childcare industry now and into the future. We wanna ensure that low income families have access to care. And we wanna support COVID-19 public health um, guidelines while being a part of the response to economic recovery. 
Um, I think it's unfortunate that it's, it has happened this way, but I think there's a real new reality and focus that childcare is essential um, in order to support our workforce in Washington. So you have heard some numbers from a couple of previous folks around temporary closures. Um, I wanted to do an inverse and show you who's actually open. And so this is a statewide picture of who is open. And this was snapshot was taken as of May 3rd. So it's um, a little bit old. And I will say we're actually seeing more and more providers come back online but you can see who's open by uh, provider type. So this is just licensed providers. That yellow bar is school age programs. The blue is open family childcare homes. And then uh, the purple is open centers. So those numbers represent the number of providers in each of those areas that were open on that day. So I'm gonna turn this piece over to Travis for him to talk a little bit about some of the flexibility that we've tried to put in place around licensing and some of the other requirements, um, including background checks and early achievers, which are part of the work I oversee, but uh, really have an impact on licensing right now. So Travis? Sure. <clears throat> so uh, when the pandemic hit, uh, we, we scrambled. Uh, and we did a couple of things. So uh, one of the things that we did is we developed uh, an emergency licensing process. Uh, we haven't used that at all, which is good news because what that means is that folks are taking their children to uh, providers that are already licensed and are quality. So really what we wanted to do is have that in place in case we saw in a community that there was, um, there was a, a, a desert that they didn't have any child care. So we wanted to be able to do that. So we have that in place if we need to use it. We haven't needed to use it at this time. And so that's an emergency licensing process. And then we also created an emergency licensing waiver so that providers can call us and say, listen, uh, I, ha I now have a sibling that needs somewhere to go because school is out. Um, you know, I typically don't take school age kids, but could I ask for a waiver at this time so that then uh, I could serve that family? Or I have a staff member that doesn't have these qualifications, but I want to use them right now. Can I use that staff member? And so what the waiver allows is really flexibility during this emergency and allows us to uh, really meet the needs of families and kids right now. So. Uh, we've done a lot of those exceptions. Um, they're temporary. They're just during the, the emergency. Um, so we'll be looking at those and seeing, um, you know, if they need to stay in place or we need to start removing those slowly. We have a normal waiver process that folks use, but it's more of a formal. This was more of a, an emergency of how we could, how we could uh, solve this problem in the short, kind of quick, uh, being responsive. One thing we also did with background checks is that due to the uh, our background checks need fingerprints um, and because of the COVID uh, some what we saw was the fingerprint uh, vendors were closing and they're not open. Um, so what we were able to do is ask for a waiver so that we're not having to go and do fingerprints at this time. Uh, our background checks, uh, one, one thing to know is, is that we do an FBI background check, which has to do with the fingerprinting, but we also do an abuse and neglect background check with the state, which is extensive looking in Washington state. Uh, have they, uh, has there ever been a CPS report on an individual? What did that look like? And then we also do our, our check within our system within the Washington courts. So it's still a really good background check. It's, we were just able to temporarily put off the fingerprint process uh, during this time so that we were not creating a barrier that we don't, that staff are not able to then be qualified to watch kids. So that was one way that we get around that. The other thing that we did with the early, early achievers is we put that on hold for right now um, just because of the complications with everything that's going on. Um, I, I would really encourage folks, we have a, we have a great uh, website uh, that has a Q&A that goes into more detail of some of the things that Nicole and I are talking about that is a great resource for parents as well as providers um, on our website, uh, which has a lot of information that we're, we're changing daily as this evolves. So with that, I'll, I'll hand it back to Nicole.
Great, thanks. Um, thank you for that, Travis. On the background checks and early achievers timelines, just so you all know, those do take a proclamation from the governor because they are statute. And so that proclamation was extended through May 31st. Um, and at that time, we'll revisit if we, want if we want to request additional extensions there. And then the other thing I would say is please don't email the DCYF COVID inbox right now. It is currently full because of all of the applications that are coming in from providers. I'm working on getting that, the size of that increased, but um, maybe next week when you have questions, that's where you could um, send your questions to. And then the other thing I just want to add, I didn't really talk about this at the beginning, um, is that at DCYF, we mobilized pretty early around our response related to childcare and a bunch of other um, items, but childcare in particular. And so um, I think Travis and I have been working on this uh, every day since probably about March 9th. Um, we've had a great team across um, our divisions. I'm really impressed with how the agency has uh, worked together to really mobilize and support providers and think creatively. Um, and as Travis said, there hasn't been an uptick on emergency care licenses. And um, so one of the things I think we really want to continue to communicate is let's stabilize and use the providers that are already there. We have an existing provider base. Let's figure out how we can support them uh, to continue to provide care. On, the, on that same note, we recognize there were some things that we could do that would help providers um, and help stabilize some of the income that they were getting, in particular if they were getting working connections childcare. There were also some policy changes that we made because essentially what happened is summertime started at the end of March for almost the entire state. And so um, we wanted to really ease uh, the burden on providers and families around uh, when things are already stressful, not having to call in and get their authorizations increased for working connections. So we were able to um, automatically go in and increase part-time care authorizations to full day. Uh, we got authorization to do enrollment-based payment from March 16th through June 30th. So that means that if a, any uh, child that is authorized and going to care at that provider, that provider can bill for them. Um, if they have to temporarily close for COVID-19 or if the family perhaps is choosing to keep their child home for several days in that month, uh, they can bill them. Uh, certainly, this has had an economic impact on, on many of us and um, on our low-income families in particular. And so we waived family co-pays for the months of April, May, and June and took that co-payment amount and put it in the payment to the provider. So that's again another stabilization uh, method. And then we provided some additional flexibility and approved activities for families who were reapplying for working connections in March, April, and May. Now what I want to say about that is that doesn't mean that if a family is coming up for reapplication and they're not working, that they're automatically going to be eligible still for working connections childcare. We do count earned and unearned income, and what we are finding is that as families are unemployment, are on unemployment with that extra six hundred dollars in there, it is putting some of our families over income. And so I just want to be transparent about that and put that out there that the thing we relaxed was approved activities. Um, one of the other short-term supports that we were just able to announce last week and just went live today, um, it was supposed to go live at 11 and went live um, a little bit before one, our Child Care COVID-19 grants. So providers who are open and currently providing care may apply to receive one-time funds and funding amounts are based on license capacity. And so you see we're looking at small, medium, and large. And funds can be spent on facility costs, personnel, utilities, health and safety, cleaning supplies, and food. So that application is live in our portal and um, within not very long, we, we already have 1,800 applications. So, and that doesn't even count the applications that are flooding the inbox. So um, I, we really, really heard from providers the need to get dollars out the door. I wanna acknowledge that this does focus on those who are open right now 
um, and that we also are really hearing what does that mean for a provider that's closed and what supports might they need when they reopen? Is there an opportunity to revisit that? So then um, thinking about long-term supports for child care providers, uh, we have child care of, of Washington providing technical assistance, coordinating supplies, um, working with regions to coordinate requests. Uh, PPE is a topic that continues to come up. Uh, child care providers are in tier three of tiered access. Uh, right now, emergency management departments are getting PPE at tier one. Providers can put in a request at their county emergency management department because they may, in some of the orders, be able to get to them. Uh, but just know that PPE continues to be um, an issue here in Washington and, and nationally. As we were thinking about this work too, uh, we recognized that there may be folks who need expanded access to our substitute pool. And so we worked with our partner Imagine Institute to do that and stand that up fairly quickly, really to support the licensed provider's workforce capacity. This can be something that could help if a provider um, is wanting to do uh, social distancing and is maybe getting a waiver to do that. That could be an access or uh, a resource to them, excuse me. And then um, again with Child Care Aware, but then also with enterprise community partners, uh, we are working to help connect providers to local, state, and federal business supports. And really working with some of our coaches around our shared services and uh, business resources. And that is all we have to share with you today. Well, thank you, Nicole and Travis. I just, um, I wanted to start by saying that we, um, and when I say we, I mean a lot of early learning advocates that I have the pleasure of listening to and speaking to what feels like on the daily these days, really do understand that the Department of Children, Youth and Families has a hugely important but impossible job these days. You know, the system for childcare, you know, as Natalie mentioned, across the country is underfunded and not, not resourced enough, not supported enough, even though we would all say that our children are our most important, important asset. And you all have to try to ensure that, they are that the children of Washington are taken care of in a quality, accessible way with not enough investment and resources from any level. And so we just, and, and that was pre-COVID. So then add the COVID pandemic and you're scrambling to come up with, as Travis mentioned, new policies that allow for some flexibilities without leaving behind the notions of some quality that we had put into place. And I just want you all to, everyone at the department to know that we appreciate the effort that you all are putting into um, everything you're doing. And uh, we recognize the difficulty of your position now. And truly, I mean, I'm gonna speak for myself as an advocate in this industry, but. I hope that you can use us as a resource to support getting greater investments and supports into the industry that you guys um, help to spearhead. So with that, we have some questions that came in from the audience. So starting off, I'm just gonna pose this question to all of you and let whoever feels um, ready to jump in first answer, or you can all answer. How do you think childcare will look different um, moving forward. And when I say moving forward, I'm going to say in the next six months to 18 months. And this is in regards to things like the use of PPE and social distancing. Do you want me to start, Travis, and then? <laughs> sure, go, go ahead and start and I'll add in. Yeah. Um, so we actually have um, a, a group that seems to continue to grow uh, that is helping us think this through. Um, and I would say it's not only the next six months, but what does childcare look like as we go through the phases of reopening? And that's really important when we know that we're going to have counties who are in different phases at different times and that we're going to have to be able to turn that dial. So we have a group that's looking at that. Um, so that does mean things like, uh, what does that mean related to face coverings? Uh, you know, I think Gail showed her screening that she's doing. Uh, you know, I think we do, we have to keep talking about PPE. Um, and what does it mean also really in the next six months, the big conversation has been around summer care 
and what does that mean as we move into summer when uh, summer camps may or may not be opening, uh, school buildings may be closed. Um, so I think those are important things to all be thinking about. And then thinking about as guidance continues to change from the CDC and the Department of Health, um, how do we keep up on that with uh, resources and supports to providers? We have a team that's working on uh, what are some social distancing resources? So what does it actually look like to have a group, a cohort size of 10? Uh, what does that actually mean? So I think those are some big pieces around childcare that, that look different from just the, the practical standpoint. Um, and I think it's gonna take everybody to serve all of these, these kids and families in summer in particular. And then we have to think about fall. So if school looks different in fall, what does childcare need to look like? What does that mean for providers? And what does that mean for families? Travis? Yeah, I, I would add, uh, we've had some interesting conversations with providers. And I think we really need to have a conversation with providers and ask them how they're doing social distancing in childcare. I, I'm fortunate enough to be on uh, national calls and we're listening uh, to other folks that do you know, licensing work. Uh, and that's what folks are really, they're, they're trying to figure out how to do this social distancing in these child cares. And I think that what we need to do is start listening, just like Gail had shared some of her things that she's doing with temperature and that kind of thing. These are new things that we're going to have to continue to do as we monitor this until we get to a point where we're all safe. And I think that it's really going to take listening to providers. And I'm just so amazed with the providers that we have because uh, the providers that stayed open, um, they, they answered the call is really what they did. And they figured out how to do this group sizing and all these different things. And they were so creative um, that I think that we re really need to just reach out and listen, okay, how are we going to be able to do this together and, and truly partner with them and listen to them. Because uh, it is, it, they're the ones that are doing the heavy lifting every single day, and they're the ones that have stayed open. And and you know, I think the bigger conversation is, is that are, are we going to move this forward? Because we've had this conversation of how important they are, but now are we are we really going to move the dial here for childcare providers? So I think yeah, I think that's a great point, and that's so the work of the childcare collaborative task force. Um, I think is really shifting now. So the task force that's looking at that, like what do costs mean? What do providers really need? And I think Travis is right. We need to hear from providers about what they need to reopen, stay open. Um, the other big thing, and we just I just facilitated a subgroup on this this morning, is around um, supply and demand, right? So everything we knew about supply and demand is now not, no longer accurate, right? It's pre-COVID. So how do we get to the new normal? And the questions that Travis is mentioning for providers, we need to ask some of those same questions of families. What do families need? What do families need to feel safe returning to care? What does that look like? Um, you know, how much space are we going to need? And then as you, again, look at the phases and look at the different industries coming back on, how many of them are going to access care? Um, the other thing that we're hearing now, this came up on a call yesterday, is that older siblings are often providing care for their younger siblings, and so that is having an impact on their schooling. Uh, so what are the assumptions we want to make around that? Because in national models, they talk about uh, older siblings being available to provide care, so care is not needed for those kids, and so do we want to make a different assumption around that? So. Um, there's always lots of questions, and I think we're getting to a really good place where we're asking questions and then taking action, which I'm really um, proud of our groups and, you know, just the state and everybody who's working on this and providers who and families who are pushing us to think about this. So I want to um, ask Gail a question. My children go to a small in-home uh, provider who is open again. And um, one of the ways she is addressing the needs of the pandemic is she's serving a smaller number of kids and she is um, limiting hours so that she has adequate time to clean because that's something that is very important. I'm wondering how, um, I know you kind of touched on social distancing, but how is, you know, how is your, I don't know how to say this in a better way, how are you doing with cleaning? <laughs> how much more of a burden is that on your workload, on your staff, on your time? Anything you can share with us about that? So what we've done is um, we've changed our hours. So we used to open at six and now we open at seven. 
for cleaning and we used to open at or stay open until six but now we close at five because of cleaning um, the other thing that we added is somebody that's coming in to do um, cleaning and bombing and the, but then we also have somebody that works six hours a day cleaning and that's that's her focus that's, that's what, what she does and then the teachers are doing the same thing too so once the kids leave at five o'clock we start disinfecting everything and then the center has already been cleaned by then because we have a cleaning person and so it gets disinfected every day and that's that's the reason that we close early which we'll probably have to keep doing for a while um don't know how long but we'll do it for as long as we have to so there's been a really big focus on the hygiene and cleaning and disinfecting and then the other thing is as far as smaller groups what we've done is um we've always had three teachers in a room instead of two teachers in a room so we've always had a lot of staff um, and we're doing small groups by having things like we've brought in an art teacher um, we have a music teacher and so our kids move from group to group which helps a lot yeah do you um do you have anything else you want to add about how you see um over the next if you can 18 months how your care is going to continue to be different for children or any other barriers to to your point um it sounds like your staff has to spend a lot of their time and energy these days on things they didn't used to mm -hmm. so any other thoughtful ideas of how you see um how you see your work changing again over the next 18 months well what we talked about yesterday was the first thing that we see when the kids come back it's going to be like the first day of school again that's <laughs> number one so that's going to be different for the kids um, our work's going to change because we're going to have to um, spend a lot more time on making sure that kids are healthy and that we're advocating for them not to come when they're not healthy um, mm -hmm. and then the other thing is that the cleaning um, we're going to have to spend a lot more time on that and then doing the small groups and we have a concern too for the kids that have gotten out of school early um, even though they're doing they're getting on um, their computer every day and they're doing their schoolwork kids will still slip and fall back a little bit so that's going to be different too because we're talking about so which of the kids do we need to um, be giving more help um, so that they don't slip back and the other thing is that um, Turner Cagle is over our school age program who does an amazing job every week he talks to every child teacher that goes to the daycare center and so he's having conferences with them finding out what the kids need help with and really trying to stay on top of that and we have some great great people that are working with graduate Tacoma and Tacoma Public Schools so we're trying really hard to stay on top of that because we can see that changing um, so there's just so many different things um, uh, we only have a few more minutes, but I could go on and on about what I'm concerned about. But, um, I'm when trying to really stay optimistic and have a really good attitude and and keep everybody upbeat and it's, it's gonna all get better. So uh, we always say that um, our staff can move mountains. So I know that whatever struggle comes our way that we're gonna be able to overcome it. And then the other thing that I've noticed is that daycare directors are working together we're actually um, taking supplies to other daycare centers um, they're showing up for things that they need we're doing the elbow like you know bumps instead of the hugs so that you know they know that they can call us for what they need and and i really like that we're all working together because i think that's really really important um, well, your children are lucky to have such an inspirational positive leader um, and I will say something I heard you say that I think I would encourage sharing with other providers is that um, you guys are engaged in community partnership with yes. the district and an organization. And maybe it's that kind of partnerships that we're going to need to forge um, in the future in this, you know, what did Natalie say, not in the new normal. Exactly. Um, and even more, because right now we're working with 12 other local agencies weekly so we're all working together and it it feel it feels better it feels yeah. yeah so natalie i have a question you might be able to answer for me or we got a question you might be able to answer um 
how do you expect the shortage of childcare options in the next 12 months to differ for students with disabilities? This is a, <clears throat> a big issue since finding care adapted to the needs of each child was already a huge challenge uh, COVID. And with reduced ratios of children, this will even be more challenging for parents, I think, going forward. Um, as mentioned in my presentation earlier, um, FFN caregivers have been and will be continued, uh, a continued support in this area. Um, and I, I think the role of supporting providers to adapt care for specialized supports was already a rich asset of the early achievers coaching system. And I think with some adjustments, every child care aware of Washington region could contribute rich supports to providers struggling to stay open in this rapidly changing climate. As Gail has mentioned, uh, a number of the things that she's doing, um, to, you know, the health and safety checks, you know, the cleaning, all of these additional responsibilities put so much more pressure and time commitment on providers. And so we've thought a lot about what can coaches and early achievers uh, support staff be doing to support, um, support providers to leverage the additional responsibilities they have. Um, an example um, for in King County what, is that we're partnering with um, the county for their emergency child care program for essential workers. And I mentioned before, since this was a slot-based model, the funds follow the providers, not a voucher program model, which where the funds follow the child. You know, the families were having to shift their children from their long-term trusted providers to a new provider who was selected, pre-selected for the program. And we found that this was really scary for many families, especially if their child needed specialized uh, care. And so uh, one of the things we did at Child Care Resources is we implemented um, a formal support process to provide targeted support to child care providers serving eligible families uh, within this new um, uh, emergency child care system. And the goal was to facilitate trauma-informed and developmentally appropriate practices to support transitions for the child into the new environment, uh, to create and foster secure bases for children, and build a provider resiliencies as, as we're all trying to mitigate the trauma um, that's coming from this crisis, both for families and children. Um, so the supports that we implemented um, are including, uh, to include one-on-one -on -one consultation and coaching uh, mm -hmm. with uh, trainings and reflective practice opportunities all of these were able to do remotely um, as well as a limited monetary support for um, programs serving children um, to ensure that the care environments are enabled to continue to provide high quality care for the most vulnerable children and those monetary supports were provided um, through private philanthropy uh, to support uh, essential workers and accessing care Natalie, I'm going to actually take your question and uh, shoot it over to Nicole and Travis. Just curious, has the department considered uh, changing up the, the subsidy program to more of a voucher-based model that Natalie spoke about? Is that at all being discussed? Or has um, it been in the past? Yeah, so I'm happy to take that on. Uh, so yes, that has been explored in the past. Uh, yes, we would love to completely revamp the subsidy system. Um, one of the things that um, I think may help would be moving towards more of a monthly rate structure. So there's the side where the family actually gets the voucher and takes it. Um, that's going to be a harder system to change to. But if we were to move to more of a monthly rate structure, I think that that is uh, a little bit more helpful because it mirrors the private market. Um, I also want to acknowledge that we, um, as an agency and many state agencies, are now in hiring, I mean, the entire state agency's hiring freeze. We have budget issues is the best way to put it right now, I think. Um, and so uh, that revamping like that may cost a lot of money, um, but certainly we'll be thinking about what does this look like moving forward. And then um, just to be transparent too, uh, things like that, we really actually have to get approval from the legislature to do when we make big changes. And so, um, I think it's important for people to know that who don't necessarily sort of live, breathe state government is that uh, really um, even our child care development fund dollars are appropriated by the legislature. And so um, that session is really important to us um, and we're likely to have a special session coming up, but we would love to rethink it. I think this has highlighted uh, once again the complexity of our system 
and it makes it complex for both families and providers and we would love to simplify. Thank you for that. That clarification is helpful. Um, and I have one last question that you can all jump in as you want because I think it's actually kind of a fun question. Uh, how can philanthropy be most helpful? What can philanthropy be funding and why to help address this crisis? Um, so I'll, I'll start with my, my one thing that I think would be really good. So they've been great so far around supplies and the work that they've been doing with CCA. So I think if they can help uh, do some of that and help push some of our businesses as well to think about how they're getting supplies to providers in a different way. I, um, be, because when providers go and there's limited limits on what they can purchase, that's an issue. And so um, how do we get folks to think about that differently? The other place I think they can help um, is related to maybe some of the care that has been stood up that doesn't quite have a funding source yet. Um, so as folks think about providing um, summer camps and some of those pieces, I think that's important. But I think the supplies piece and uh, if, if there's any granting that they can do to providers also may be useful. But I would, I bet Gail has some wonderful ideas that she's been thinking about. <laughs> oh, Gail, I'm still on mute. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Good. Okay. Um, I think um, they've been doing a great job with helping to um, allow us to get food and give out to our families. Um, so they've been helping with dollars for uh, food, which I think has been the number one thing that I could think of that we could do for families right now. And then as far as providers, um, supplies for those items that you need and you're going to need more of because school is out. I think that's great. So supplies and food, the first thing I think about. And then of course, um, I think a lot of providers are going to need more space. Um, I think that's going to be an issue, especially when you can only have um, nine kids and one provider in a room. I think people are going to be looking at um, creative ways to spread out in their facilities. Yeah. Natalie, anything else you want to add to this quickly? I would say too that um, their support in providing subsidies for um, immigrant populations that are not eligible for working connections for mm -hmm. state supports, um, that would be hugely helpful. And I know that there have been a number of funders who've done that and that's been hugely useful. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, the conversation was really informative for me, and I know um, it's the first, not the first, it is one of very, very many conversations around this crisis that are going on, and one that we continue, we want to continue fostering from the Foundation for Tacoma Students. Uh, investing, increasing the investments in the child care industry and early learning in general was one of our policy priorities for 2020, and it is something we will continue to advocate for with all of our friends across the state. Um, next week, we will host another Friday Forum, Funding Relief. This is part one of a two-part topic. We'll consider both how local philanthropy and learnings from 2008 will help us through our current economic breakdown. Hear from individuals behind the Pierce County Connected Fund and the Economic Opportunity Institute as we discuss how best to prepare for economic recovery in the months ahead and where philanthropy can be filling the gap for Tacoma residents. You can register for Friday forums by visiting graduatetacoma.org and navigating to the COVID-19 page. Once again, thank you to everyone out there for listening and we hope you have a wonderful weekend.